Australian cities and towns are dotted with local cenotaphs, monuments and memorials, erected as stark reminders of our national and local contribution to war. The words of Rudyard Kipling's recessional, Lest We Forget, echoed throughout the nation. Australians were not going to forget in a hurry those people who fought and gave their lives for our country. School teachers, drivers, nurses, engineers, miners who worked in the tunnels were all working on the New South Wales South Coast. More than 430 personnel who enlisted in the First World War came from the Urubadala. The war had been raging for more than three years. There was no sign of a peaceful solution. Holroyd Robert Innes joined up with his cousin Charles on May 14, 1918. As farmers, they wanted to do their part with their mates. He already had a brother that had gone, and uh, this is what was told to me from my dad. The family, because they had a farm and what have you, they weren't real keen on anybody else going. And Dad was the next eldest, and he was sort of carrying the show. Um, he was already a timber cutter then, he was working on the farm. So they didn't want him to go. When he went to England, and they were in the training camps before they went over to France, uh, they had a, they'd been training and been going pretty hard. And they had a Sunday, and they're going to have the Sunday off. So they had to turn up, they had to get all dressed up in their like parade dress at that time. And uh, they had a, had a Sunday um, uh, like parade. And anyway, after the parade, they said any people that would like to go to their different denominations for the next few weeks, we're going to have uh, padres here, and you can go to your church service. Otherwise, you can go back to barracks. And Dad said, well, he, he'd had enough. He didn't want to sit in the church for three hours because the services went pretty long then. So he said, no, we won't take that option. So they, they, dismiss, uh, they, they marched off the brakes of different denominations and uh, dismissed those guys. And he said, they just got back to the barracks and there was a sergeant major down there going, all right, get changed, you know. And they went and walked in, worked in the horse stables for the rest of the day. And, and so, so next Sunday, well, before that though, there was about half a dozen in the horse stables. They said, we can't tell the other blokes what we got to do. So, because they'll laugh at us. And they said, so they went back, and when the blokes come back from the service about three, four hours later, they said, what are you blokes been doing? They said, oh, we were playing cards. <laughs> but the next, Next Sunday service they had, they got all dressed up and they went, different denomination, went, Church England, that's me, I'm over there. <laughs> and, uh, and some of the other blokes thought they were going to go play cards, so they got caught out. <laughs> but uh, he said, yeah, so if you get the option, you know, it's better to go to the service. <laughs> the soldiers arriving home did not speak of the horrors and tragedies of war. For some families, it's only now, 100 years on, where they talk and are remembering what their fathers and grandfathers, aunts and uncles did for our nation all those years ago. Holroyd Robert Innes was one of the fortunate ones to arrive back on our shores to begin a new life. My cousin Rob was here the other day and he was telling us that uh, the day before the war ended, uh, a, a, one of his mates um, got shot and died in his arms. So I think that might have um, stopped his memories a bit or didn't want to tell us about it. Uh, Rob said later that the actual family looked him up and, uh, and they, all, they all met up. And uh, Rob's mum said, one of the only seen, times I've seen Dad cry it's like, I remember lots of times where we just sat around like we didn't have the TV and such and uh, they'd just tell stories. So, uh, uh, but, but I, I remember when Dad got near the end of his life, he's talking about, you know, like there were still things like he would like to do and, and he was sort of trying to pass on to us that, you know, there's, if you've got something you need to do, you need to go and do it. And I think it come from that story like with the young bloke. So. 
but he, but he would tell you a story sometimes to get a point across. It did not matter what the role was. All contributions from infantrymen, light horse, sappers, nurses, pilots, engineers, tunnelers, gunners, drivers, instructors were equally important in order to defeat the enemy and achieve victory. As soon as Holroyd arrived in France, he was in the thick of it. His initial role was machine gunner during the 100-day offensive, resulting in a total break of the Hindenburg Line. He later became a driver, supporting units with supplies to the front line, and later reverted to the title of gunner before returning to Australia in May of 1919. And it's lovely talking about the battles of 1918 because at long last you've got something cheerful to talk about. Although there was loss of life and although there was great difficulty and, and although there was many casualties at both Mons and Quentin and Peron, at least we could say it was worth it because they won. When we were redesigning the galleries a long time ago at the Australian War Memorial, we realised that we had to transition people from Gallipoli, which is the last of the 19th century battles, it really is armies opposing each other where they would fight with rifles and machine guns and we had to transition people from that understanding so in almost intimate fighting to the fact that on the Western Front it was all shells it was all artillery what was going to kill people well getting out of a trench wasn't the you know the healthiest thing you could do and crossing no man's land to attack but raids and things like that were localised. Whereas when the British started their battle, the first day of the Somme, they were, men were going forward to 6,000 bullets a minute coming their way. But horrendous as that is, it is still the artillery that's going to do them in. So you've got these enormous guns behind, miles behind the front lines that are lobbing shells over. In, in, we just can't imagine the, f the frequency of the shelling. It just goes on and on and on. And we see the results, the churned up land, the destruction of absolutely everything. You know, there's not a tree left standing and, and all that. Um, and they're miles behind. So other lower level artillery pieces were also used, but they were more mobile and that's what uh, that's what your man was doing. He was moving guns to where they could be more, more useful, um, sighting them, and then, uh, and then allowing the gunners to operate them. And um, so the, the three major weapons on the Western Front were these very big guns miles behind the front line, the mobile artillery pieces that were like bits on a chessboard moved around, and then also, and most crucially the machine gun so you've got you've also got machine gun uh, units um, and machine guns people don't recognize this a machine gun bullet can travel about one and a half kilometers from where it's fired so you don't have to be right up close to to do the killing but they often were they often were and you just sweep the battlefield Holroyd Robert Innes was a farmer and a skilled axeman who could turn his hand to anything and his generosity of spirit was not lost on the townsfolk and his employees. This spirit forms part of the national identity known as the spirit of the Anzacs. Charles Bean, the World War I writer, described the Anzac spirit as that of reckless valour, enterprise, resourcefulness, fidelity, comradeship and endurance. Holroyd Robert Innes possessed all these qualities but the word fidelity, above all, typifies his character. Is, um, we use the word fidelity and generally we hold that in the context of marriage, but to their mates, is that's exactly what it was. Is they, they had a, such a deep-seated um, relationship in what they went through together, the comradeship of that, uh, the camaraderie, uh, the, the anguish, the... Um, Things that we we will never understand, uh, but the oh, I know grandfather displayed that through the rest of his life. Uh, he returned home. He met this gorgeous woman that he ended up marrying, and and you read in his letters uh, where he speaks of meeting this gorgeous little woman <laughs> and and their their relationship and the time they and then he continued that on r right through the rest of his life. Uh, he was always um, really close to all his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. Uh, they were very dear to his heart, even to the 
point of time is that uh, when I ended up getting married, um, I, we missed the opportunity that when our firstborn uh, grandfather had died just the year previous. And, um, you know, we were always, um, we'd sit with the kids and say, oh, our grandfather would love this. And uh, that's how it was. In later years, this spirit helped him to diversify and prosper in new emerging industries of tourism and hospitality and help create, with other family members, a lasting legacy of the now iconic Batemans Bay Innes landmark, the Boat Shed. During the early 1900s to the 1940s, timber and fishing were the focus of Batemans Bay's employment. There were more than 15 timber mills dotted up and down the south coast supplying and transporting timber to the nation. One of the more well-known supply companies was the Illawarra Steam Navigation Company, who had several contracts to supply railway sleepers, which were shipped to Sydney, Melbourne and New Zealand. Within the, the context of where we're sitting today, uh, just right next door to us, uh, the Illawarra and South Coast Steam Navigation Company had their uh, shed and, and wharf. Uh, so all the sleepers would come to town, they'd be depoted here. Uh, grandfather's role at, at the end of it was to go through, sort the sleepers, pick the good ones, leave the ones that weren't square enough, things like that. Um, but the good thing about that was that the boat shed here that we're sitting in now, grandfather actually took this business on knowing that pikes were gonna close down their operations. That kept him locally, um, kept the family local, and uh, just moved us into a whole new phase of life from then on. And uh, it's been great for us as kids growing up here. Well, Pikes um, supplied timber to the New South Wales government for building railway bridges, um, wharves, things like that. And back in those days, obviously a very big industry. Uh, but Grandfather uh, started down here with Pikes. He ended up becoming uh, the head of Pikes locally. Uh, and they actually supplied sleepers to New Zealand. Uh, the main reason Pikes closed up here in 1957 uh, was due to the fact that the New Zealand government had an oversupply of railway sleepers and uh, no longer required sleepers. So it was grandfather's job then to go through and actually notify all of the cutters uh, that there was no further requirement for their services. And uh, for him, that was shattering. Grandfather was one of those blokes that um, he was that fair, even though a lot of the cutters weren't very good at their trade. Uh, grandfather would do whatever he could to ensure that you know, their sleepers got through, they got paid, even if he'd end up with a pile <laughs> of sleepers out the back that he had to throw away. Um, and, and that was just how he was. I, I'm sure um, he didn't make a fortune out of it because of that reason. So, so moving on from that, the hire boat business, a uh, man by the name Bert Atwell originally built this shed in 1947. Grandfather took it over the mid-1950s. Um, at that stage, uh, Mark would be starting to become a twinkle in his mum's eye, I suppose. <laughs> and I wasn't a little bit later. But um, from that, um, Grandfather and Nanny uh, took over here. Uh, they, had, they had a thriving business in the sense of um, the rural sector in Australia then was doing very well. Uh, a lot of the landed gentry would come to Batemans Bay from places like Wagga, Hay, Balranald, places like that, and they would spend you know, a couple of weeks over here for their summer holidays. And it was those sort of blokes that um, you know, grandfather you know, got to, to know, uh, to, to spend time with, and um, even to the regard that you know, he would send my dad to Balranald on the train to drive old Bill McCulloch back here in his jag so that he could <laughs> spend a fortnight here hiring his boats, and then Dad would get to drive him back in the jet and come back by train. So it was always a you know, good experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, It was great having Grandfather around. Holroyd and the Innes family have left a successful legacy to their children, and now the next generation are working in the tourism and hospitality business. Tourists can enjoy a leisurely cruise on the majestic Clyde River. My grandfather, he was just a treasure to us, and still is today. Um, this last couple of weeks, uh, through meeting you guys, has been great for us to, uh, to experience things that we didn't know about him, uh, to find out a little bit more about what he looked like as a young man, 
uh, in that period of time where he went off to war, uh, you know, in his early 20s. Uh, for us to see pictures of him back then, I mean, that's been a, an amazing thing. Because as I said, we only got to meet him midlife and then through to his old age. And to actually have a picture of him as a young man, uh, that's, been, that's been a great experience. Still indelible ties to the Great War remain in the town as a nation constantly reminding us of the toll paid by past generations for the freedoms we enjoy today. Lest we forget. I'll tell you a beautiful story is um, my sister is a 10 years younger than I am. Um, so we had the privilege of growing up living here at the boat shed. Uh, Nanny and Dad at the time lived up in Pacific Street. Grandfather would come down every day and be involved with the boats, with their hire boat business. But uh, my mum had grown up uh, as full nursing training. And to her, um, cleanliness, hygiene was paramount. <laughs> but grandfather would be working on the boats. His hands were always dirty, greasy. And uh, this one day he walks up and my sister Elizabeth's crying her eyes out. And grandfather just walks up with these huge hands, dips a big finger in the honey jar and sticks it in her mouth. <laughs> and Liz sits back and goes, oh, that, yeah, I'm just thinking that's great. Well, for <laughs> mum, who's this hygiene freak, and grandfather's got this great big finger stuck in this little girl's <laughs> mouth. That was grandfather all over. Yeah. Um, he didn't want to see anyone not being happy. And that was his, you know, and that was how he did it. And, uh, and for him, that's just how he spent his life. Yeah.